you're never done practicing sound. This is one of the key realizations that you need to come to terms with to be a great brass player. Since we know this to be a fact of life for us as trombone players, it's important that we have a toolbox of strong approaches that help us to refine and maintain this part of our musicianship. Today, we're going to dig into a technique that I've practiced on and off for the last 15 to 20 years, but I've just for some reason never applied it to my jazz playing, and that is practicing with no tongue. If you're like me, that's probably the main place where you have maybe used this practice technique in your own playing on um, something like a Roshu or another lyrical etude where it can feel like, all right, this makes sense to kind of get the tongue out of the way. I'm trying to work on legato. I want to really focus on coordinating that slide technique. I really want to focus on keeping the air as smooth as I can across those partial changes so I don't have to use tongue. However, I would argue that trying to work on this in other areas of musicianship can really be a great gateway to refining your sound and particularly working on consistency of sound. Even though the title of this video says that this technique is going to fix your sound, I really don't know that we necessarily need to think about that. It's really just another tool to help refine this. Uh, we're all in the process of sort of becoming the best player that we can be, and so our sound is constantly under development and should really be one of the primary things that we spend a significant amount of time practicing from a fundamental standpoint. So whether you feel like your sound is, you know, kind of a mess right now, or you feel like it's pretty good, I think this technique can actually help you quite a bit. Before we get into putting this into a jazz context, which is actually the way I've recently added this to kind of my practice regime, let's talk about just what we're listening for when we do this sort of practice. The way our air and tongue work together, I think is one of the central challenges that we face as brass players. I know for me, I often think that the tongue is the causer of problems in some cases, and the air is sort of the solution to the problems in many cases, but it's really how they work together that we need to really refine. And this really gets at that issue. For my money, there are really three things that we are listening for when we're doing this type of practice. The first is, are we hearing clear glisses and a very even sound as we change notes that are in the same partial. Do we hear absolute evenness on those glisses? We're really using the glisses here to monitor for little dips in our air and dips in our sound. The second thing that I really like to key in when I'm working on this is do I hear a very even and consistent sound on long notes? That evenness is achieved through not forcing the air. The more we force the air through the aperture, the more we're going to get little tiny shakes on those long notes. The more we start to force the air, the more we're going to start to tighten up the embouchure too much. And as soon as we start to tighten up the embouchure too much, then we've got to force the air even more to get the lips to vibrate. So the two kind of work together and it's a real snowball effect here. So we really want to only use as much air and as sort of as much face as we need to. Now, ideally, we don't really want to think about that. We just want to listen for an even sound coming out of our horn and sort of let the brain kind of fill in the gaps in this sort of way of practicing. The final thing that I really like to listen for is do I have even transitions when I have partial changes? So using the partial changes to kind of help us with articulation and smoothness of articulation is, you know, something we all work on as brass players, but this is a really great way to see if we are doing so. I think those transitions are pretty smooth. Again, if our air and maybe our embouchure is not doing the, quite the right thing, if we're trying to sort of like make the embouchure shifts happen, like here with our face, we might get a little bit of this. You could hear some of that kind of like in-between noise in between the partials. Now, there is a place for that actually being helpful as a monitor to be like, is my air really moving across those partials or am I sort of breath pulsing there? But generally speaking, we want to listen for that quick response. Again, not so much about thinking what the embouchure is doing, but listening for melody. So that's probably all relatively familiar to you if you're watching this and you have practiced this technique before. Now, if you haven't ever used this technique, I would stop this video right now, go get your Roshu book out or whatever lyrical etudes you like and try this on some of them. It is an absolutely 
fundamental practice technique. And for me, it's like the first thing I do whenever I'm feeling like my air is maybe not where it should be for a particular passage. If that is working for you, however, let's talk about putting this into a jazz context. Now, as I mentioned, this is something that I actually recently just started practicing. I don't know why I never really practiced this in terms of my improvisational voice or even just working it on tunes for that matter. But it's something that I just decided to start working on recently and it's really helped the consistency, excuse me, consistency of my sound. I've always felt my sound is relatively good. However, when I go to actually put it on tunes or when I'm improvising, sometimes I feel like it can sort of run away from me a little bit. It's great when I'm playing long tones, even I think pretty solid when I'm playing a row shoe that is very sort of like defined. But as soon as I start improvising, it can get a little bit hairy. To this end, we're gonna look at this in two different ways. We're gonna first look at it on a tune. We're gonna use the tune Recordame. This is a great example because it forces us to encounter a variety of the challenges that we might have as instrumentalists. Um, this is a little more challenging tune because it does have some jumps in it, quite a few partial changes. Uh, if that feels a little difficult for you, start with easier tunes. When I first started doing this a couple months ago, I was working it on ballads um, to start with. If you do want a little bit more support about how to work through this process, you know, and if you're starting from zero on this, hit me up in the virtual studio. Um, there'll be a lesson on this along with a handout that kind of works in a more step-by-step -step process if you need a little bit more support there. So hit that down in the description. You can join us there and see a little more information about how we work through this, but we're gonna start with Recordame for today. If this is a tune that isn't familiar with you, I'd really encourage you to go check out the original recording. It is on the album Page One, which is a Joe Henderson album. They play the melody relatively short on that. I can tell you when I play this tune, I don't play it quite as short as them, like when I'm actually playing it on a performance or at a jam session or something like that. Just to hear the tune, just so you kind of know what you're dealing with, it sounds like this. <laughs> The original version of this is sort of like a blue note Latin type of tune, you know, and say it's a super authentic kind of Latin groove, but has that sort of like 50s, 60s blue note um, kind of vibe. Now for us, I was using tongue there, clearly. But for us today, we're gonna to talk about playing that with no tongue. And there's a few things that we really wanna key in on. Number one, we really wanna be able to identify quickly where all of our partial changes are, so we know where that is happening. And then secondly, we want to know where they're not. So we know where we really want to listen for that smoothness. Let's just take a look at this first line. That's one of the trickier ones to execute in this tune or when it comes back um, modulated up to the key of C minor. So a little bit of practice needs to be done there to be able to navigate that all smoothly. And again, I'm really not thinking about what I'm doing with my embouchure. I'm listening for melody and thinking about focused, uh, consistent air. You could hear just a little chip there going from that E to that B natural. That's something that I would practice to try to, you know, kind of weed out of my playing. Now, if we continue on here, we're going to start to get some more stepwise motion. And that's where we can really think about listening for these glisses between uh, slide positions to see if I'm having a consistent airstream. I'm going to play it slower and almost a little out of time so I can make sure that that air is really working. Hopefully you could hear that when I had things that were in the same partial, for example, the third full measure, not the pickup measure, but the third full measure, I have an F sharp to a G to an A, and then I do go to a B natural, but I have those three notes that are in this in a row that are in the same partial. So I should really hear that smooth gliss. Then I've got that one little partial change at the end. Now, you don't necessarily have to take that technical of a view on it when you're performing it, but I think for this practice technique, it is important to really recognize that so you know what to listen for. If your air is sort of like dipping on each one of those slide position movements or changing, and definitely when you have that little partial break from the A to the B natural, you might hear a little bit of something like this. I think that's the classic breath pulse where we have that little push of air on each note rather than keeping that air consistent and letting the tongue do the articulation. 
Now we can kind of work it in two ways. We can either really lean into those glisses so we hear that, or we can think, I want to try to eliminate those glisses by having super quick and accurate slide technique. Now I'm not gonna change my air. My air still has to be consistent. I actually think you should start by having those glisses fairly prevalent throughout. Let's maybe just listen to that through the second half of the tune. So you could hear a big juicy gliss every time I don't have a partial change. You might also notice that on any repeated notes, I'm not repeating that and I'm not articulating that at all. I'm just blowing through them for this technique. Now, let's take that same section and I'm really gonna focus on moving my slide precisely right on time. Not early, not late. I'm not gonna get into that next position until I absolutely need to, but my air is gonna be really steady. That is gonna help clean this up a lot. This combining of smooth air and very quick slide, I think is the generally most common reason people use this exercise. Definitely on a Roshu or another lyrical etude, that would be why. But when we move this into an improvisational context or even just a jazz tune context like this, that is really going to help the evenness in our sound because we're so focused on each one of those notes just being dead straight. So that way, once we add a little bit of articulation to it, maybe a little inflection, it's just gonna sound great because we're starting from a foundation of so much consistency. Let's hear that little section if I add a little bit of tongue, but just kind of focus on some of these concepts being the grounding for it. Every articulation, every bit of inflection, every forte piano is just gonna pop when we have this really baseline level of great consistent sound. All right, so there's this concept on a tune. What if we move this into an improvisational context? I would advise you to probably start on a tune just so you can get really confident. As soon as we start introducing a lot of freedom in improvisation, we can sort of get sidetracked and maybe we're not really working on this core concept. But once you feel like you have good control over it, let's move it into um, some improvisational stuff. So I'm gonna take the last eight bars of this tune. Um, I will put the changes up here in case this is a tune you don't know. And I'm gonna play through these with this concept. I'm gonna go in a slightly out of time fashion so I can really focus on, am I keeping this air really consistent, um, particularly as I'm moving across the ranges and when I have any jumps. Now, I'm gonna play mostly long notes here, very little syncopation, just because I don't wanna get my tongue involved at all. So let's check out what this would sound like with no tongue. As you could hear, very, very connected, very, you know, kind of soupy in some places because I've got all those glisses in there. I would say the better you are at doing like the natural slur stuff, something that I wouldn't say is my real strong suit, um, you can probably do this much better than I did in that particular example. However, I was really thinking about lines that would lend themselves to this sort of playing well so I could really focus on air moving smoothly. Not a lot of rhythm, not a lot of articulation, that type of thing. I would never really play this way probably. It's all about an exercise to move my air concept into improvisation, where at least for me, sometimes I find that it tends to break down a little bit. Okay, that takes us through applying this type of practice technique to both jazz tunes and some improvisation stuff. I'd really encourage you to check this out in your own playing. I've actually been pretty surprised how well this has worked for me. After just doing it for, I don't know, maybe six weeks, I really think it's improved the consistency of my sound a lot. And it's, this has meant that I just feel more confident playing. Therefore, the ideas come better, my chops feel better, the range feels better, the intonation feels better, just because that foundation of sound is just feeling like it's on lockdown at all times. 
As always, if you find some of this information useful, hit subscribe, hit like, all the good stuff that you do on YouTube. And particularly, if you want a little more support practicing this, check us out in the virtual studio. Um, there's some good hand-up material and an additional practice session. And actually, for this video, there'll also be a little etude on the tune recordame that sort of is written to emphasize some of these concepts. All right, we'll see you in the woodshed.